series. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 15, 2 Samuel chapter 15. Chapter 2, verse 15, starting with verse 13, it says, A messenger came and told David, The hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, Come, we must flee, or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. The whole countryside wept aloud as all the people passed by. The king also crossed the Kurdron Valley, and all the people moved on toward the wilderness. That's in verse 23. Now skip down to verse 30. But David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered, and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too, and were weeping as they went up. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for taking us on this journey through the life of David and what it truly means to have the heart of a champion. Father, as we begin this new chapter here at Vallejo Drive, we thank you for how you have challenged us, how you have uh, directed us, how you have corrected us. And Father, as we close out this series, we want you to give us what our major take home is, what you want to leave us with. So our hearts are open to you, bare, barefoot. We are humble. Fill us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen, amen and amen. Absalom, Absalom. Absalom is the son of David, and his story is notorious with rebellion and betrayal. He's the son of David, but there's a reason why he gets to this point where he's chasing after his father and trying to usurp his authority and power. You see, it wasn't just, wasn't very long ago, but, but, but a handful of years prior to this experience, there was a situation that had happened in the house of David. The young adults and I had a chance to talk about it uh, Friday night uh, about a week ago when David did not go to battle with his men and he just hung out at the house and he was up early in the morning just walking around and uh, surfing the web Bathsheba.com and um, he allowed his lust to get the best of him even though God had already blessed him with so much um, this is what you need to understand about human nature about the the product of sin that even when we are blessed with everything our heart could ever desire Sin always leaves us dissatisfied and wanting more. David, who had it all, still did not have Bathsheba, and that made him very unhappy. Remember Adam and Eve, unhappy with perfection? Remember Lucifer, unhappy with perfection? This is why we must be very careful when we talk about not being happy, not being satisfied, needing to move on to greener pastures. Because I'm going to tell you, no matter how green those pastures are, you will eventually become dissatisfied. And this is why Jesus offers us the water that if we drink it, we will never thirst again. Somebody say amen. So... Bible tells us that the, 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 the family experienced a fracture. Those of you who know the story very well know that David uh, got caught. Uh, Bathsheba was pregnant from their experience. And just so you know, Bathsheba was not a willing participant in this story. David had all the power and all the control. There was no consent. And so what he did was, 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 was cruel and it was violent in many ways. And I say violent not necessarily because he had to physically lift a hand towards her, but it's violent because it takes away her right of choice. But she sends word. She texts David and says, listen, I'm pregnant. And so David wants to change the narrative so it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't implicate him. And so he sends for her husband Uriah to come home. And, and he says, here, come home from the battle. Thanks for being such a good soldier. Why don't you just hang out with your wifey, enjoy her company. But Uriah is a certain type of man. He's different. He's like, no, my, my fellow compadres, they're out in the field. They're sleeping in tents. I am not going to go to my house. So this messed with David's plan, his scheme, and so he said, I need to change the narrative again. 
Uh, it's, it's clearly not going to be Uriah's son, so I need to change the narrative. And so he has Uriah sent into the hottest part of the battle and tells his generals that, to pull back the troops and leave Uriah there to die. That's dark. That's dark. And this is why you have to be very careful who you select as your heroes in Scripture, because as much as we want to revere David and pump him up and celebrate him, he did some things that not even Saul did. Can I be honest with that? Not even Saul did stuff like this. And so, so, so Uriah dies in battle, and of course, the narrative has to change again. David says, oh, let me take in this poor widow Bathsheba. And of course, the kingdom is probably thinking, what a nice and sweet man King David is. So thoughtful, bringing in one of the most beautiful women in our country who was all alone, without children. And look at what David did for her. And so she, of course, gives birth to a child, but you know God had to call David out, sent the prophet Nathan over with a story that, again, implicated David. And David says, I'm that man. I'm guilty. I messed up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord. And everybody wants to celebrate David because he asked for forgiveness and he repented. Every time someone brings up the heart of a champion, the heart after God's own heart, they always want to say it's because David repented. But let me tell you something. Being like God doesn't mean we repent. Let me tell you why. Because God has never had to repent. God has never had to ask uh, uh, for forgiveness. God has never done anything that was evil that he has to say, I'm sorry, let me fix this up. So David having the heart of God is not because he repents. It's something else, and we're going to find out what that is in this story. Yes, David repented, but can I be honest? David repented because he got caught. The prophet called him out. And, of course, everybody started to find out about this, and, and his children found out about it. Oh, that's what daddy does? And nobody gets in trouble? Someone will say, yeah, but their first child, Bathsheba and David's first child, dies. That's the punishment. Oh, that happens all the time. That ain't really that bad, I'm sure some are thinking. So Amnon, one of David's, David's sons, he's like, yo, daddy can do this kind of stuff, so can I. And he has the hots for one of his half-sisters, Tamar, and he devises a plan so that he can be with her, again, without consent. Listen, the Bible is not the children's stories we thought they were, right? I don't know how Maxwell was able to do an entire series for children. My son was in my office uh, a few weeks ago, and I'm like, hey, get off the iPad. I want you to read some Bible stories. So I started going through one of the Maxwell books, and it was on the life of David. I said, this will be perfect, son. I'm preaching about this. And I'm looking through the stories, and I'm thinking to myself, there's not one story I want my, nine, my 10-year-old boy to read. Not one. I'm looking through all of them. I'm like, look, violent, bloodshed, oof, ugh. The Bible's dark, it's violent, and that is why I'm telling you right now, this is what makes the scriptures for me all that more inspired, because God does not gloss over our messiness. He's transparent about it. He wants us to see what sin looks like. He doesn't just put the flowery, wonderful, loving, you know, joyful, peaceful moments in there. He lets us look in the mirror and see what sin truly reflects back at us. And so here we see this happening. Amnon takes his half-sister Tamar by force, and it gets ugly. Absalom is like, Dad, do something about it. And David, who just got caught in some mess, doesn't feel like he's in a place to be judgmental. Have you ever been there before where you want to call out somebody's sin, but because your sin is out there too, you're afraid to say something because you don't want to be judged yourself? Let me tell you something. Being a sinner does not disqualify you from calling out sin. Let me say that again so everybody in the balcony can hear. Being a sinner does not disqualify you from calling out sin. This is why the church exists. We help keep each other accountable. Just because I may have failed in this area doesn't mean I can't preach about it. There have been times I'm like, Lord, I can't preach that. I'm still, I'm still struggling with this. And God said, this message is for the people, not just for you. Don't just preach about the things you have victory over. 
You're preaching my word. I have a message for my people. And you know what? You need to hear this message again. So I got to preach it. So don't think every time I'm up here preaching that's because I'm, I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm pure in this particular area. So this is really important for us. So as, as believers, we hold each other accountable. And in other words, if somebody is struggling on Bathsheba.com, this should be something that we as brothers and sisters can talk about freely amongst ourselves, that we can be transparent enough and vulnerable enough. You want to know why? Because when we have a community that is like this, non-judgmental, helping each other, holding each other accountable, not judgmental, but holding each other accountable, it promotes healing and restoration. When I know my brother and sister, they have eyes out, they're, they're checking on me, they have my back, they're, they're, they're saying, you know, Jonathan, uh, uh, you told me a few weeks ago that this was a place where you were a little bit weak. How's the struggle going? The enemy wants us not to talk about our mess, doesn't want us to be open about it, because if we are, we'll become stronger. So David does nothing about it. He does absolutely nothing about it. Amnon is left to go free. Uh, Tamar is, 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 cannot be married. She goes to live with Absalom. She, she's, 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 she's barren. She just lives a, a, a very tragic life. She has so much trauma that she has to work through. And she's there and, and in Absalom's home. And Absalom sees her every single morning. And his anger is burning. Why doesn't dad do anything about it? Dad is a coward. So Absalom decides in his heart that he's going to take matters into his own hands and throws a party. All his brothers are there, including Amnon. And the Bible says that Absalom takes his brother's life. He then flees, and David finds out about it. And the Bible says that David, he weeps. He weeps for his son Amnon, but he still doesn't do anything about it. He allows his son to be ostracized from the community away, and David is so sad. And let me tell you something right now. This is so critical. David's tenure as king after Bathsheba is depressing. He's a hermit. He doesn't want to leave the palace. He doesn't want to rule. He's clearly not even dealing with his own family dynamics. It takes one of his his, his advisors to, to beg him and, and come up with a story in order to coax him to bring Absalom back to the community. So after years away, Absalom is then receives a, a, an invitation from his father, but his father allows him to come back to Jerusalem, but will not see his face. He agrees for his son to come back to Jerusalem, but refuses to see his son's face for two years. See, this is the problem I have when we try to reconcile. Our reconciliation is so messy and so incomplete. I've heard people say stuff like this. Oh, I forgive them. I just can't talk to them ever again. Oh, I forgive them. I just can't be in the same room with them. Oh, I forgive them. I forgive them. And you know why we say that? Because we don't want to seem like we're, we're not spiritual. Oh, no, I forgive them. I forgive them. It's just, you know, they're just consequences. David acts like he's forgiven Absalom, and the kingdom rejoices with Absalom coming back to Jerusalem, but he refuses to see his son's face. Word gets back to David that Absalom is hurt over this, broken over this. Dad, you don't think that I feel bad what happened to my brother, what I did, but I was angry. You did nothing about it. I needed justice. I was tired of looking at my sister's face every single day, seeing her tears. I, I, you needed to do something about it. You're an absentee father. And now you bring me back under the pretense that you have forgiven me, but you don't even look at me. Reconciliation. Watch this. It's going to hurt. Reconciliation is bringing someone back into the fold and treating them as if they had never made an offense, had never come against you, had never wronged you. Reconciliation is restoring people back to their former glory before they sinned. 
No, pastor, no, no. I mean, I forgive. I just can't trust. You know, what if God treated us like that? I forgive you. I just can't trust you, so you ain't coming to heaven. I, but I forgive you. <laughs> but you can't see my face. Is that forgiveness? It's not. I get it. I get it. But that's different, pastor. That's God. He's different. He's better than us. Yes, yes. But we've been called to walk in his footsteps. Why would we call ourselves followers of Christ if we refuse to follow Christ? And just in case you think Christ wasn't very specific on these issues, he very much was. He even got to the point where he's like, listen, if, if your brother has anything against you, not even if you have anything against your brother, if your brother has anything against you, you'll don't even come to church. Go to her. Go to him. Amen. Fix it. Right. Well, those are the people who are your brothers and sisters. Oh, no, Christ made it very clear who our neighbor was, who our brothers and sisters are, and even applied it to enemies. If someone strikes your face, on one side of your face, give them the other side. God gives this even to his enemies. Read Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 is one of the most beautiful chapters penned by Paul, where Paul says that while we were powerless, while we were still his enemies, this is when Jesus came to die. Not when we were friends, not when we were his homies, not when we were his amigos. When we were enemies, bloodthirsty, and wanting to crucify him, that is when he sent his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The father sent us his son when the world was at its darkest, most fearful, most power hungry. And this is when he sent his son. Can I tell you something? This is going to make you feel uncomfortable. I know this, I know this, I know this. But grace always opens us up for more hurt. Grace always opens us up for more potential hurt. I don't want to forgive her. I don't want to forgive her because if I forgive her, she's going to probably hurt me again. I don't want to forgive him. I don't want to give him another chance. I've already given him enough. How many times have you heard that? Or you've said it yourself. I've already given them enough. Can you imagine God saying that to you? I've already given you enough. I'm done. Fifteen times we've been struggling with this. Fifteen times you've come and prayed. Fifteen times you've asked me for, for, forget, for forgiveness. I'm done. Peter says, how many times can we forgive one another? Seven, and then Christ, knowing Peter's not good with math. Says seven times? Seventy. And Peter cannot add that up. He can't multiply he knew what Christ was saying to infinity and beyond. Amen. Infinity times, Peter, infinity times you forgive someone. Never grow tired of forgiving people. Now, I know what you're going to say to me, but pastor, should we not have boundaries? Absolutely. The forgiveness process does have boundaries. That's not just to protect yourself. That's also good for the person because boundaries help instruct that whatever behavior they were doing was harmful to you and the relationship. So there are times I understand why couples will separate, but separate with a purpose. Sometimes it takes a separation for the, for the family, for the couple to know something is really off right now. But we separate with a purpose. Reconciliation does require boundaries, but those boundaries should never prevent us from reconciling. Are you understanding that? Now, I understand it takes two to reconcile. You may have a spirit of reconciliation, but the other person doesn't. I know there's been stuff that's gone down in this church. I know there are people that, that are uncertain about ever attending again because they've been hurt. Their feelings have been hurt. I get it. I understand hurt. I understand pain. I've told people before, heal up. Take your time. Again, purpose. It's okay to separate from the community. Take your time. But don't find yourself in the seat of judgment. 
where you say to yourself, yeah, I mean, still a member, I pay my tithe. I just don't want to see your face. Right? That says something. But family, don't, no, don't judge the people that say, I don't want to see your face. That just lets you know how much they were hurt. Right? That lets you know how much they were hurt. And that is why we must be intentional about not hurting one another in these ways again. Amen? Amen. Don't worry, this is the last sermon of this series. I get, so we'll, we'll talk about nicer things later. So this is what's going on with Absalom. And so Absalom, he comes back to his father's court. Finally, David catches word that Absalom is sad and he's heartbroken. So he allows Absalom to come back. He sees Absalom. He kisses him on his face. And Absalom goes back to his home. He has a family. But time has done something to Absalom. He does not trust his father. It appears that he comes back and is, and is ready for reconciliation with his father. But the Bible tells us that Absalom begins to conspire against his father. He starts sitting out uh, by the gate and talking to everybody who's passing by. Yo, what's going on? How are you doing? And the Bible tells us Absalom was a gorgeous man, good-looking man. I mean, probably as good-looking as you were, Brother Sam, <laughs> and as good-looking as you are right now, right? So just very good-looking, and he had long hair. He would cut his hair once a year and, and, and sell it. You know, they were making weaves. I don't know if they were making weaves, but he, the, Bible does say that, the Bible does say that he would cut his hair and they weighed it, so I don't know. Maybe they were. Um, the, but the reality is he was good-looking. His hair looked great, uh, and, and, and his, his smile would just, would just would diffuse any situation and melt hearts. And this is why we read in the scripture that the hearts had turned to Absalom. He'd say, what's your problem? Oh, hey, come here. Come on. Let me, talk to me about it. I know, my dad. I know. I, listen, <laughs> I was raised in this dysfunctional home. <laughs> I know my dad. He's not going to listen to you. If I could tell you some of my childhood stories, mm, I should be on Dr. Phil. He was doing this for years, years, just getting to know people, learning their names, trying to help solve their problems. Absalom was just, I mean, he was smooth. So he goes to his father and says, hey, dad, I'm going to take a little uh, vacation. I'm going to be gone for a little while. Dad says, oh, son, bless you. And while Absalom goes away, he starts sending out messages that, uh, <coughs> a new king is in town. Y'all ready to see how a kingdom should really be ran? Now, why would this happen under David's rule? Again, as much as this reflects on the heart and character of Absalom, it also reflects on the heart and character of David. That David was, had disappeared to the point, he didn't even know what was going on at the gate. <laughs> David should have been there with his son saying, hey, son, let's, let's do this together, tag team. David was gone. Now, I just want to pause on this for just a second here. The fact that David was shut in his home had to do with his own shame. A lot of times when we have failed somebody and failed in a relationship, it is very difficult for us to be reconciled because we feel like we should be punished for our sins. And this is critical because as, as, as David is marching away from the city and everybody's crying and they're going up the Mount of Olives, there are people that are just wailing on them. Somebody from the clan of Saul starts pegging David with rocks. That's what you get, fake king. David is getting rocks hurled at him and his soldiers say, can we kill him? David says, no, no, I deserve it. I deserve it and worse. God sent this man to throw rocks at me. That's what David says. He sent rocks. He sent this man to throw rocks at me. And the rock hits him in the head. No, I deserve that one. And we have people that are unwilling to be reconciled because they believe their offense, their sin is so grievous to the Lord that they don't deserve to be loved. They don't deserve to, to have grace. They don't deserve mercy. Listen, stop this because your obsession with your shame and you believing you deserve more punishment is also selfish. And it also says something to God. God, I don't believe your forgiveness 
completely sets me apart as holy. I don't believe your forgiveness completely restores me. I don't believe your forgiveness has truly separated my sins as far as the east is from the west. Basically what you're saying to God, I don't believe you. Anytime somebody says, I don't deserve this, I don't deserve, well, yeah, of course you don't. None of us deserve mercy. That's why it's called mercy. None of us deserve grace. That's why it's called grace, unmerited favor. So David, is in, he's, he's in the doldrums right now. He doesn't believe it, and it gets really bad. Can I tell you how bad it gets? It gets so bad that even Mephibosheth, remember the one that was the grandson of Saul, the son of Jonathan, the one who was the cripple that David said, you can eat at my table all the rest of your meals? Even Mephibosheth is like, yo, I'm rolling with Absalom. <laughs> what? What? David runs into Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, and he says, Ziba, what are you doing here? He says, hey, man, I want to give you some donkeys, I want to give you some bread, give you some wine. I just want to help you out. He goes, where's your master Mephibosheth? Well, he's in Jerusalem. He thinks his father's kingdom's about to be restored. Yo, that's, that's dirty. But what did I tell you? Grace opens you up to what? Hurt and betrayal. Like, this is the name of the game. This is just life. But can I say something else to you? Even when you don't show grace, you still open yourself up to hurt. You're going to get it one way or the other. People who do not want to be merciful, people who do not want to forgive, people who are not gracious, people who do not want to reconcile also live in constant pain and fear. Walls up. Nope, you're never going to hurt me again. And let me tell you something. The, 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 the way in which we love and forgive is proportionate to how we also receive. Those who do not want to love, those who do not want to be gracious, those who are not willing to forgive also don't know how to receive it. Everything is doubted. Everything, everything is, is seen in a negative light. David is marching in despair. Mephibosheth has turned his back on him. Uh, Ahithophel, David's most trusted counselor, also turns his back on David and is serving Absalom. There is so much betrayal coming on, and this is when we read. Let's turn with me to the book of Psalm. Psalm chapter 41. Psalm chapter 41. This is when, when David pins this psalm. The beginning of it, he talks about uh, God loving those who are weak and those who are on their sickbed, God will restore. Verse 4 says, I said, have mercy on me, Lord. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. All right, David, I like it. Theologically, you're right on point here. You sinned against God. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? When one of them comes to see me, he speaks falsely while his heart gathers slander. Then he, do, then, he, then he goes out and spreads it all around. I know there's some people that have been a part of slander. You've, you've, you've been uh, the, the recipient of it or you've been the one who's been spreading it. It's, it's not fun. I understand that. David's like, I get it. I've been there. All my enemies whispered together against me. They imagined the worst for me. Put a pin in that. A vile disease has afflicted him. He will never get up from the place where he lies. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. Ooh, Brother Schubert, who quoted this text in the Gospels? Who quoted this text? Jesus. When he was in the upper room with his disciples, you remember what Judas did dipping his bread? Jesus quoted this psalm. The one I have shared breath, bread with, they have turned against me. Someone who's a, a close friend, someone I trusted, one who I shared bread with has turned against me. Jesus is quoting this passage saying that Judas fulfilled it. Does Christ know what David's going through? Oh boy, this makes this, this passage messianic, doesn't it? It makes what David is going through messianic. 
David understands this. Now you're going to say, but, but, but again, pastor, this didn't work out well for Jesus. <clears throat> Look at what Judas did. But that would never stop Jesus from recruiting Judas. It would never stop Jesus for dying for Judas' sins. One of the points of this series is I wanted you to understand that no matter where you are in life, most of us, if not all of us, at one point or another have been Absalom or we've been Saul or we've been David or we've been Michal. We have been one of these characters, sometimes all five, all six, all seven. Some of us have been Goliath. All of us have blood on our hands. All of us are guilty. Paul says in Romans 5, all have fallen uh, short of the glory of God. All have sinned. All of us have been considered at one point or another enemies of God. All of us at one point or another have lived in Ziklag with the Philistines preparing to fight against the army of the Lord. All of us have struggled with our mental, emotional health. All of us with our spiritual health. All of us. It's a church full of broken, sick people. And this is why David pins this. Have mercy on me. Heal me, Lord. I'm on my deathbed. Someone who was really close to me has betrayed me. I shared secrets with him. And Jesus says, I know. Judas was also one of my closest friends. I love him. Not loved, I love him. And this is not the first time I've experienced betrayal. Lucifer. He also I love. Oh, God would never love Lucifer. No, no, God is love. He can't do anything but be who he is. Even now, God loves Satan. His adversary loves him. If he didn't love him, he would chain Satan to his side and say, you are never leaving my side for eternity. And that would be hell. So what do we do? Fortunately, David, who's on the run for his life, has somebody who has infiltrated the council of Absalom and gives him poor advice on David's behalf. And Absalom finds himself in some trouble. In verse 6 of chapter 18, we're going to start to wrap up here. In chapter 18, verse 6, it says, David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel. And the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. There, there Israel's troops were routed by David's men, and the casualties of that day were great. 20,000 men. The battle spread out over the whole countryside, and the forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. Verse 9, now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair while the mule was riding, kept on going. When one of the men saw what happened, he told Joab, I saw Absalom hanging in a tree. Joab does not want to be the one to kill the son of the king. So he offers silver to the man and says, you do it. Man, there's so much of this that ties in with the passion experience of Christ. Remember Judas? How many shekels that he was willing to betray Christ for? But it won't happen. The man said, I'm not going gonna, gonna, gonna to be responsible for killing the son's king. I'm not going to do it. You, you can't pay me enough. So finally the, the soldiers then surrounded Absalom as he was hanging in the tree by his hair. And the Bible says they struck him until he died. Now, of course, many of you would think this is good news for David. He's been, he's been restored. He's been, he's been vindicated. David said when he left Jerusalem, he said, leave the Ark of the Covenant here. If God is pleased with me, he will, he will have me to return. So it seems God must be pleased with him. Everything is going well for David. David wins, right? The victory is David's. Verse 28 of chapter 18. Then Amaz called out 
to the king, all is well. He bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Praise to the Lord your God. He has delivered up those who lifted their hands against my Lord the king. Oh, these are the best parts, man. When our enemies who have been slandering our name, they get it. My mom used to always say this, the Lord don't bless ugly. And I love being able to repeat that when somebody got what I thought they deserved. That's right. They should have never did this to me. They should have never said this about me. They deserve what they're getting right now. The Lord don't bless ugly. And I would think that David is about to just, just go into it and say, that's right. Can't believe what my son did. And I'm telling you, the stuff, I can't read it because there's too many kids here, but the stuff that Absalom did to disrespect his father was next level. Verse 29, the king asked, is the young man Absalom safe? Wait, sir, did you just hear what I said? I just got done saying God has delivered you and your enemies are vanquished and, you know, let's celebrate. No, 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 no. I just want to know, is my son safe? Is the young man Absalom safe? And then Ahamas answered, I saw great confusion just as Joab was about to send the king's servant and me, your servant, but I don't know what it was. The king said, stand aside and wait here. He, he stepped aside and stood there. Then the Cushite, who was also coming to give a message, arrived and said, my lord, the king, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all who rose up against you. This is good news. The enemy has been vanquished. The king asked the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? Cushite replied, may the enemies of the Lord, the king, and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. And then the Bible says in verse 33, the king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and he wept. As he went, he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. If only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Wait, 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 David, do you know what he did to you? Do you know what he said about you? Do you know that he was trying to kill you? I know, but all David cared about was the safety of his son. And when he finds out his son has died, what he wants to do is to take his place. David finally gets it. David finally gets it. David now for the first time, not with Goliath, not with Saul, not with all his many victories, now David finally gets it. He now has the heart of God. Because when God saw us hanging in a tree, he too said, oh, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter, if only it could be me. Adam and Eve failed at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and God, I know, was saying, it's messianic, God is saying these words, my, my son and my daughter, what did you do? But God can do something that David cannot. David did not have the power to be able to substitute himself for his son. But our father, Amen. Jesus, he could be that substitute. I will hang in the tree for you. Let me hang instead of you. Do with me as you please, but I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose you. If only it had been me, I don't want to lose you. Family, this is the cry of our church for one another, for the lost. I do not want to lose you. I would rather take your place. 
I don't want you hanging there. I don't want you to suffer anymore. I w- Take me instead. That's what Jesus says. Take me instead. I am guilty of their sin. I shared this with someone this week. They, they told me in an email, they said, I'm struggling with what you said about sacrifice. I'm struggling with what you said about sacrifice. I said, just wait until the next message. Because that is our call. That is our mission. This is the banner. We are people of sacrifice. This world is not one with muscle. It is one over with sacrifice. And we sacrifice one another. We sacrifice ourselves for one another. We sacrifice ourselves for one another because they matter. If only it would have been me instead of you. That attitude changes lives. It rebuilds relationships. It restores communities. It grows churches. And we have to have the heart of a champion that that says what David says. If only this is your church. If only. Family, Jesus didn't just say if only. He could have, but he did better. He didn't say if only. He says, I will come. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever just believes this shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I want the praise team to come up. We are going to sing this song champion one more time as we close out this series. Everything that we've been doing, and there may be someone here today that We missed our anointing service last month. There may be someone here today that that you want reconciliation in your life. You may not want to be completely open and honest about everything that's going on, but you want reconciliation. Just like David was anointed to be the king, and we started this series off with anointing. I want to close it off with anointing as well. I'm going to ask the elders and pastors to come forward if they have any oil. If there's anybody here that just wants a special prayer as we sing this last song, that you can come forward and you can ask for that spirit of reconciliation to permeate all throughout your life, that you can transform relationships, rebuild them. And I believe they'll be better than they were before. They'll be stronger. If only, if only. Jesus didn't say if only. He did it. And he hung in that tree for you and for me so that he can reconcile us back to the Father. So that we could see his face again. No matter who you are and where you come from, our doors are open to you. This is your home. This is your church. You'll be safe here. You'll be safe here. Come. Come.